Good evening, everyone. It's uh, it's lovely to, to be with you here in, in Bally Halbert again this evening. I think the last time I was here it was a it was a cold, dark November night, and this is entirely the opposite. It's a, it's a lovely warm June evening. So I know there's plenty of other places that you you could be in an evening like this, maybe down at the beach or something like that. But we're we're very glad to see everyone who's who's made the effort to to come along, and I trust that you'll be blessed as a result of being here this evening. Um, I want to read a few verses in Luke's Gospel, please. If, if you have a Bible, you can turn along to it in Luke chapter 15. Um, Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. If, if you don't have a Bible, you can just listen along to it. It's a very, very well-known parable that the Lord Jesus told when he was here on earth. It's Luke chapter 15 and verse, verse 11 that we're starting at. This is the Lord Jesus speaking, he said, and he, and he said, a man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that is coming to me. And so he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a, a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his estate in wild living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began doing without. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the field to feed pigs. And he longed to have his fill of the carob pods that the pigs were eating, and no one was giving him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired labourers have more than enough bread, but I am dying here from hunger? I will set out and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired laborers. So he set out and he came to his father. But when he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, slaughter it, and let's eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and they approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received them back safe and sound. But he became angry, and he was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you never gave me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead, and has begun to live, and was lost, and has been found. And we know God will bless the reading of his, his word this evening. I think this is probably one of the, the best well-known parables in, in all of the Bible. Indeed, much has been said on it. And you, if, you've, if you're familiar with services meetings like this, uh, you're, you're likely very, very familiar with this story. Um, it, is, it is, I suppose, the, the gospel with, within the gospel. It's nearly, a, I suppose, a snapshot of the gospel itself in this one story. It, it really is a, a remarkable and amazing parable. And I think maybe maybe what tonight's message is, it might not necessarily be new ground. Like I say, if you're if you're familiar with the story, maybe there it, it'll not be all that much that's new to you. But in, in terms of the the gospel message, 
uh, I want us to, to see how it is one of the clearest and, and most striking pictures of the gospel story. And, and hopefully there will be something in it for, for, for everyone here in the meeting, whether you're, you're not a believer yet in the Lord Jesus, you'll, you'll see the, the clear application of the gospel here. And if you are a believer, um, there will be something for you in terms of the, the demonstration of the love of God for each and every one of us um, in this hall tonight. I want to take time to, to look at all of the three major characters uh, in the story. Um, the, the son, uh, the, the first son, I suppose, the most well-known son, the one who goes off and lives this, this wild lifestyle for a time. And I suppose since it's, it's Father's Day, we'll, we'll have a, a special mention of, of the father and his role and the love that the father has specifically. Um, and, and also the, the, the other son too, who sometimes left to one side, he has a very important role too in this story. And I hope you, you did have a, a good Father's Day today. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely occasion. I got a, a few gifts this morning from, from my daughters. Um, didn't get breakfast in bed though. My, my youngest usually tips the cornflakes all over the floor. So we didn't really want that happening in, in the bed. So, so we, we, we avoided that. Um, but I think this, in, in terms of this parable, it's a, a parable that, that demonstrates the, the wonderful and the, the mighty love of, of our Father God. And, and ultimately, that's what, a, that's what an earthly father should demonstrate, isn't it? That someone that should, should love their children unconditionally, always willing to forgive them no matter what happens and seeking to, to lay everything aside for their children, no matter what the cost is. And sadly, that often isn't the case in, in this world that we live in. Many have absent fathers. Um, some have had that experience of fathers who've maybe shown little or, or no interest in them, or for, what, for whatever reason, didn't really fulfill the role that, that a father should play in a, in a child's life. But God, the father here, is shown as, as someone who loves unconditionally, despite their children seriously disobeying them, seriously shaming them. He still loves them and he's willing to take them back no matter what they've done. Simply, it, it tells me that God loves me in spite of everything that I have done. I, I don't merit, I don't earn his love, but he gives it to me unconditionally, regardless of anything that I do. I'll not look at the, the parable necessarily verse by verse just for the sake of time, but what I, I really want to get is the, is the overall flow, the overall message of this parable. And just want to take, I suppose, each of the characters really in turn and look at them for, for a few moments. And I suppose, like I've said, that this youngest son, he's the one, I suppose, that gets the most coverage when we look at this parable. And I think we're quite familiar really with, with what happens and, and how he demands his portion of the inheritance from his father. And he, he goes away and he, he wastes it he wastes it all. He, he might have had his, his share of the inheritance bought out in cash. It mightn't have necessarily been the case that he was given a plot of land and then he had to go and sell it. I think um, what was quite common in those times is that he would be given a, a share of the inheritance in terms of cash and he gets this big, I suppose, pot of money and he, he just sees all of the things that he can go and he can go and spend uh, this on. And he goes and he wastes it. Uh, I, I quite like what the, the way that the King James phrases it. He, it says he spends, he wastes it on riotous living. And I think that conjures up some images of maybe some of the things that, that he gets up to. He lived a, a riotous lifestyle. He, he lived a wild, excessive, extreme lifestyle when he got this money. And he just, he blew it all and he wasted it in this far country. And in the immediate context of this passage, we have an audience of scribes and Pharisees. And if, if you know anything about the, the scribes and fa the Pharisees in the Lord Jesus' day, they, they were the, I suppose, the religious elite, the, the people that, I suppose, held a lot of sway in that society. And they always murmured about the Lord Jesus. They, they didn't have a lot of time for him. They didn't like the people that he associated with. They didn't like the fact that 
He communed with tax collectors, those people who served the Roman state, that occupying force in Israel. He didn't like, they didn't like the fact that he associated himself with sinners, those people, the outcasts of society, those ones who, people who just weren't like the scribes and Pharisees. They, the, they didn't have any time for these collect, tax collectors and sinners, but the Lord Jesus made plenty of time for them. He associated and he communed with them. And this parable was really to, to show uh, that the people who the Lord Jesus communed with, these tax collectors and the Pharisees, they were just like the lost son. Their actions had, had led them astray. There was no doubt that they were sinners. That's not disputed. But contrary to the opinion of the scribes and the Pharisees, God would gladly welcome them back. To, in the mind of these scribes, these Pharisees, these people were just, they were, they were forgotten about. So there was no point trying to reach out to them. They were as far away as you could get from God. But the Lord Jesus was trying to show that God loves them. That's why the Lord Jesus came into the world. He, he came into this world to save sinners, to seek and to save them primarily. Consider Zacchaeus. You might know that that little tax collector that Luke speaks about. And the Lord Jesus came and he seeks him out. And there's a specific mention given to this man who the Lord Jesus seeks out. And I think we we can all identify with the younger son, if we're all honest. It's not going outside of the, the context of, of this message to say that, that this applies to us. We are, I suppose, to use that uh, biblical language, we're, we're Gentiles. We're not, we're not Israelites, but we're, we're sinners. We've, we've gone astray as the bible says we've gone our our own way we do our own thing and we serve our own purposes maybe for some in the meeting tonight this means that you have lived a life of rebellion and sin maybe you've been like the younger son and you've you've had that experience in your life of of going to that i suppose far country so to speak of going to a place where Maybe your parents didn't want you to go. Maybe getting to a position where your your friends or your family or whoever it was, a place maybe you didn't even want to go to yourself and you, you wasted it. You wasted that time, that effort in that, I suppose, riotous living. Maybe others have, a, have had a, a less dramatic lifestyle, but tonight still finds you with, with no real relationship with God. No time in your life where you've accepted the Lord Jesus as your saviour. And wherever we are in our life, if we've not come to God for forgiveness, if we've never had that experience in our life of trusting him, we are just like that younger son in that, in that far country, in that place where there, there's no connection to the Father, far from him and in need of rescue. So let's come back to the son for a moment. What the, the, the passage is actually saying. Well, what, what happens to him when he, he goes away and he, he wastes all this money? What, what actually happens to him? Well, he runs out. He has no, no resources left. And he finds himself in the worst possible position for a Jew. And uh, I think he really could not get to a lower place for a Jewish boy than in the muck with dirty unclean pigs and he's he's so hungry that he wants to eat their food and to again to the the mind of the the scribes and the pharisees as they hear this they just think what an utter shameful thing has happened here to this son he he's he's there and he's hungry and he just wants to eat the food of these dirty unclean pigs and it it said in that that passage that I read um, in the translation it called it carob pods and it likely means that it's a type of food that even though he wanted to eat it he couldn't actually bring himself to do it he wouldn't be able to digest the food but he was so hungry that he wanted to eat this food it even looked appealing to him and he, what a hopeless state he's in but at the same time. He makes a resolution. He realizes that if I go back to my father and if I confess my sin, I'll realize that I'm not worthy to be called his son and I'll become a hired servant. But maybe, just maybe, if I say these things, he'll forgive me and he'll, he'll, he'll give me some mercy and make me like, like one of the slaves in the house. And I think that this contrition in his heart is beautiful to see. He realizes his, his sin and his guilt 
and his need. And he realizes that the only option left for him is to go to his father and to beg him for forgiveness. To just plead and beg and realize that he's done so much shame. But hopefully that his father will in time maybe forgive him. And again, this parable applies directly to us. No one has ever become a Christian without getting to this position, have they? No one in this meeting tonight, those of us who are, who are Christians, we acknowledge that time in our lives where, where we knew we needed to trust the Lord Jesus, where we realized that we couldn't get to heaven by ourselves. That place of, of perfect beauty, spotless sinlessness, and realized we could not get there by ourselves. We couldn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. And there is nothing in our lives that we could do to get there. But that the Lord Jesus Christ had done it all on the cross of Calvary. He he went there and he paid the price of our sins on the cross of Calvary. And that is is the place that someone needs to get to if they're going to be saved. And it's the same tonight for anyone in the meeting who who maybe hasn't had that experience, to realize that I am a guilty sinner, but Jesus died for me, as as the hymn says. And uh, I quite like the, the words of the publican or the tax collector in, in, in Luke chapter 18. And he, he says to God, he's, he's on his knees and he's pleading before God. And he says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And that, that, is, that is the position to get to tonight. If you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus, to, to realize that, that I, I am a sinner in the sight of God. I have, I have offended him. I'm just like this young son in the far country. I've wasted the opportunity so far that he's given to me. But if I go to him, he'll forgive me and he'll accept me. Um, and he'll save me if I come to him and I ask his forgiveness. And we read that he, he arose and he came. So he, he not only made this resolution that he would do this, he actually got up off of his feet and he, he came. And he, he, could have, he could have, of course, decided to just remain among the swine and think, well, you know, he, he might forgive me, but, you know, I'm, I'm too proud. I'm just going to stay here um, and, uh, and deal with whatever comes my way. But he made the decision to rise up and to go back to the Father. What did the Lord Jesus say elsewhere when he was down here on earth? He said, seek and ye shall find. And there's, there's a requirement for us to approach God for, for forgiveness. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't just happen automatically. You know, no one just becomes a, a Christian overnight. It doesn't just happen in someone's life. It doesn't, it's not just an automatic thing that's, that's turned on one day. It ha- someone has to actually come for forgiveness like the son does. But what a, what a response, what a wonderful, amazing response that this son receives when he goes back to his father. The father sees him a long way off. Perhaps he was looking for him for, for months and for weeks and for days, and maybe even years. And he's always scanning the horizon to see when the sun would come back. And then one day he spots the sun a far way off and he runs to him and he embraces him and he kisses him. And this is a, a son, remember, that shamed him so much, that brought him so much discouragement. And certainly in the eyes of, of so many of his neighbours, it would have been a shameful thing to, to, to know. People would have probably talked about him behind his back, about what his son did in dishonouring in him. And, and he was within his rights to not only turn him away, but even to, to have him killed for, for what he had done to him. He, he, he deserved death. And there, there isn't even a, a period of, I suppose, a thawing out, which, which could have been uh, understandable. You know, that maybe had taken a time to reacquaint themselves with one another and maybe over a course of a few weeks or so that he would begin to forgive him and begin to welcome him back. No, no it's, it's immediate. The father leaves everything. You get this image of him just putting everything down and running to the son and just embracing him with open arms. He forgives him immediately and prepares that feast for him. And what a, what a joyous thing that is to think about as believers. Isn't those, those of us who have trusted the Lord Jesus, who've experienced this, to know that we have, we've been in this position before, haven't we? We've been far away from God and sin, but we've been immediately and totally forgiven by him when we came to him. And I just ask that question again. How, have you experienced this? Don't think about anyone else tonight, but, but think about yourself. Have you had that experience in your life 
where you've, you've come to the Lord Jesus, where you've experienced this forgiveness of sin and trusted him. Maybe even in your, your life you've, you've had that time, but maybe you've, you've gotten away from the Lord. Maybe circumstances have happened and things have just gone cold. Maybe you've, you've gone in the wrong direction or, or whatever has happened. I want you to know that, that God will welcome you back with open arms if you return to him. God is, is loving and he's just, and he will forgive you no matter what you've done. If you, if you come, you take this attitude of this son. Realize you've done wrong, but go back to the father and put your trust in, in him. He will forgive you, welcome you back from, with open arms. Just remember that, that finished work of the, the Lord Jesus on the cross, that he died for you. He rose again, and he's able to, to, to save you. And to give you uh, that home in heaven if you'll come to him tonight without any exclusions. It doesn't exclude anyone. That is the wonderful message of the gospel. That it doesn't apply to just a select few in this world. To, to good people or people who earn it or merit it. It applies to each and every single person in this world. Well, what about this, this other son, just before we, we start to draw to a close? Well, what about this other son that's been there the whole time? And as I said, he's often left out, maybe of messages like in this parable. Um, he's, he's just as wicked as the other son. Maybe you've never thought about it in that way before, but he is just as much a sinner as the other son is. And even though it doesn't seem that way on the surface, he has no love for his younger brother. He has no love for his father either. And he speaks with absolute contempt and hatred about both of them. He is angry. He becomes angry when the other son returns home and gets this welcome. And he refuses to go into this feast that the father has set for him. Notice that he doesn't even speak to the father. There's no direct communication between them. He actually goes to another one of the father's servants and I think the word is translated something as, as like a perimeter boy, a, a servant that doesn't really even have that much position, just someone who was on the perimeter of things. And he, he goes to this, I suppose, quite minor source to inquire what has happened. He, he could have went to directly to the father, but he goes to this, I suppose, this outlier to, to ask what, what is going on. It shows that he, he doesn't have a real relationship with the father either. It's actually the father, on the other hand, that comes out and pleads with this other son. And I think what we see is that outwardly, the son conforms. On the surface, he seems to do everything right. He's moral on the outside and he looks good. And to the Pharisees, he would seem like he was in the right state here. But deep down, he despises and he hates the father. And he hates the love that he's shown for this other wicked son. And again, just to go back to the immediate context of this. This is speaking about the Pharisees themselves. Angry with the Lord Jesus' love for sinners and tax collectors. They, they hated the fact that he showed attention to them. They couldn't understand these concepts like mercy and forgiveness and the fact that salvation was by faith and that it wasn't earned. It was all to them about working and about earning it. And they felt that they had inherited God's favor by what they had done. It wasn't about anything um, that, that God gave to them. Just like this son. And this second son, as I've said, he feels like He's earned it all because he's entitled to it. And the father actually has to go out and plead with him to come in. And something that would never, ever be done in this culture. It would be a shameful thing for the father to go out and to plead with this son. But he just, he just wouldn't go in. He wouldn't come into the feast. And he, he too is just out for this inheritance. He's just like the other son. The other son demanded it. But at the same time, this older son, he realizes that, well, you know, one day I'm going to get the inheritance. One day this, this big portion is going to come to me and I'm just going to hold on and wait for it to come. And that's, that's all that he really wants. He doesn't care about the father. He doesn't have any real love for him. All he wants is, is the inheritance. And you know, that, that's just like so many people, I think, in our, our world today. I mean, they think that they have earned their place in heaven. Whether that's by good works, by coming to church or doing charitable deeds or, or whatever it is. Maybe in their own minds they think that, that they've earned heaven by themselves. And I wonder does that apply maybe to anyone in the meeting tonight. That 
you know, we can be guilty of it at times, but thinking that, you know, I, because of this thing that I have done or this act that I do or, or the fact that I'm inherently a good person that I'll be in heaven. Well, this parable of the Lord Jesus is telling you exactly the opposite. It's telling you that you don't deserve heaven by yourself, that you can't earn God's forgiveness, but yet he gives it to you freely by admitting your faults and your sins to him. And it tells us that we're, we're wicked sinners like this son, even seemingly moral people like this second son. It's only through the father that we get to come to the feast. It's only through him that he welcomes us in. There's this picture of heaven, this feast. We, we don't deserve to be there. We haven't earned it, um, but it's only through seeking God's forgiveness that we'll ever be in heaven. I think all of us, as I draw to a close, should should be able to identify with, with these sons. For, for many of us here in the meeting, thankfully, that's our past. We can look back on it and we can see, we can identify ourselves with these sons, maybe. And we can appreciate what God has brought us into, what he has forgiven us for, and what he is giving to us currently and on a future day to come. Let's be, be thankful for that if we are believers here this evening. Perhaps maybe you're, you're still like one of the two sons. And tonight, if, if that does apply to you, realize your, your need of forgiveness. Realize that you need God's forgiveness for your sins. But at the same time, appreciate that he'll welcome you back with open arms if you'll come to him. Come, just come to him as, as the first son did. Admit your, your need of him, your lost condition. And he'll accept you, as I've said, with open arms. It's good, uh, it's good to, to think of a father's love today, isn't it? Uh, to have this time of... Uh, this this time, this day and the year to appreciate what what earthly fathers can do, but let us not forget the this greatest example of a father's love and that that of our, our heavenly Father uh, above, who loves us so much that He sent the Lord Jesus into the world to die for us and to, to welcome us into heaven. So thanks for listening. I'm just going to close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father. We. Thank you again for wonderful parables like this that have been left on record for us to consider, Father. And even though they're, they're only a few verses in length, there's, there's such immense and profound truth in them, Father. And we pray that something that has been said through human lips tonight would, would speak to, to some in the audience. And maybe that there's, there's some who, who haven't trusted your son as yet, that this would be the experience in their life where they would do so. And realize their their need of the Lord Jesus and and come to him um, tonight for forgiveness and for salvation, Father. And again, as those of us who who are already believers, Father, we can look back and we can see that time in our lives where we we realize that great need of the Savior. And we're we're thankful for that that amazing welcome of the Father who who welcomed us back with with open arms, so to speak, Father. And we thank thee for this, this tremendous and immense love that has been demonstrated to us by the Lord Jesus and his sacrificial death for us on the cross of Calvary, Father. Again, we thank thee for our time together this evening. Pray that thou wouldst bless us um, as we as we leave. Um, and we thank you again for our time together in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.